You've talked about wireless radiation from cell phones and Wi-Fi and laptops and other gadgets. Can you tell us anything more about the risk and, and how we can protect ourselves from this? Yeah, I mean, so the way radiation works, um, or EMF, electromagnetic radiation, um, is essentially it's radio waves. And we have a whole spectrum of radio waves, and some of which are used in x-ray technology and CAT scans, um, all the way to radio waves where, you know, you wouldn't expect to turn on your radio and listen to music and get radiation exposure, because those are wavelengths that have not been considered harmful in any way. And there's sort of this middle of the road um, uh, wavelength that's really microwave um, wavelength. Um, and so that's the area where most of these cell phones and technology are in, is in that range. And that has been considered to be harmful because we now have studies that show that exposure to that level of radio wave close to the body creates heat. It's about signaling to um, cell phone towers. It's, it's basically, I believe, 90 um, uh, clicks per second. I mean, that's the kind of cellular connection there goes on. So when you hit, you know, airplane mode, you're cutting off that connection. So I do recommend that quite a bit when you're not using your phone or sleeping. Um, but what's interesting is that microwave sort of spectrum, and I have it in the book, and I'm going to see if I can find it. Because I want people to understand that, you know, microwaves work fine, and you shouldn't be afraid of your microwave itself, because it's in a box, typically called a Faraday box, which means it's a closed protected sealed space. So it's okay to have microwaves eating your food, technically. I mean, it may break down nutritional components, but it's not gonna hurt you, um, but it's sealed, it's blocked. We are essentially now living in our own microwave because we don't have protection from it. Um, and so if you kind of step back, you understand that we have waves running all the time with all these cell phone towers and Wi-Fi running 24 hours a day. So this is what I wanted to, show you, but I don't know if it's backwards, but essentially we have electromagnetic radiation and this is a picture, an image kind of showing, you know, what we use it for, which tech toys we use it for and why we use it and what the ranges are. And I think that's a really good perspective because again, not everything is going to harm us or kill us or give us trouble, but what we do know about certain wavelengths, we can actually reduce those exposures in very simple, practical ways. What about our lawn care and the chemicals they apply to it that are designed to kill? Should we be concerned about insecticides, herbicides, and pesticides? Yeah, I think you just named my chapter. Um, let me just see what it was called. It was called Insecticides, Herbicides, and Other Pesticides, colon, Chemicals Designed to Kill. Yeah, sides. Yep. So, you know, these things were designed to kill things. Um, we're afraid of bugs. We're afraid of bacteria. We're afraid of viruses. We're afraid of a lot. And a lot of that is marketing. Because we do know that many of those, you know, bacteria and viruses that are in our world actually help our immune system bolster it, are part of our GI tract without any clinical or problematic problems. Um, but we have such uh, an enormous um, amount of, we have, uh, I think, over 3,000 pesticides that are now allowable on the market. Again, most have not been tested for safety or toxicity. Some have been removed from the market, like chlor chlorpyrifos. Um, we know glyphosate is a whole host of problems. Um, that's, that's pretty pervasive. Um, you know, the, the thing is we've gotten good at, at creating these chemicals um, and we've made companies very rich at doing so. And the idea that we need them is turning out to be a falsehood in order to create food sources that we really need to think about regenerative farming and ways to clean up our soil. So it's not nutrient deplete, depleted. Um, many of these chemicals like glyphosate need to be sprayed multiple times. They're desiccants to dry out the, the, the crop, but they're also used to, as an herbicide, most widely used herbicide nationally and even internationally in some countries, um, although it's, it's changing rapidly. Um, but they have to be applied more so now because many of the, the weeds they're designed to kill are actually becoming resistant and they're growing in more plentitude and, and more aggressively. So they need multiple springs. So now we have a bad chemical being sprayed once, which is bad enough, but now in multiple springs because of this kind of cycle. The other thing is farmers are really held to um, use the seeds that are paired to these pesticides. I mean, that's the new shtick, right? Is that they create the pesticide um, and then they create um, the seeds genetically that will withstand that pesticide. And farmers are obligated to use these seeds and it's very hard for them to get away from Monsanto who runs the gamut of this, this industry um, and to use seeds that are not genetically engineered. 
So we have a real problem also because we need to feed our farmers and our farmers are not necessarily on board, but they have no choice. Um, and so that's a real social and economic issue that I think needs to be addressed. There are ways to do this without pesticides. There's a, a program even that we, we talk about in the book called Beyond Pesticides, which is a Washington DC nonprofit. And they have enormous number of resources for farmers to um, change over. And I'm actually working with our local farmer trying to, uh, to work with him to change over. He's like 95 years old and he's willing to learn. So there's, there's always hope. What actions can I take to protect me from chemicals and antiperspirant and personal care products? Well, the first thing I would say is there's lots of things, but first thing is the less is more approach, whether it's cleaning products, whether it's, you know, industrial chemicals you have in the garage or in your home, the less is more approach going back to a place where we don't need a specific cleaner for a doorknob versus a, a wall versus a glass window. I mean, we've been so specialized. It's almost like in medicine where you need to go to a finger doctor and a nose doctor and an elbow doctor. It's like we've become so specialized that we forget to see the whole. Um, many of the safest cleaners and the safest cosmetics um, don't require a lot of ingredients to do their job. And I think when people realize that they're, they're going to start to understand why certain beauty companies are really exploding because they understand that concept and they're moving in that direction and the market is following them. Um, so I think the first thing is remove stuff you don't need. Second thing is look up cosmetics, personal care products, cleaning products on vetted websites like Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. Um, we call out a lot to them during in this book, but there's other resources as well. And, um, you know, really vetting out which products you put in on and around your body. Um, as a note, I, I teach high school, I teach college. I want young people to understand this stuff because teenagers use the most personal care products daily than any other de demographic, 15 to 17 products daily versus a, a women who use 12. And of course, men use six, um, maybe should use more. But anyway, um, you know, the idea is that the people who are most, um, hormonally challenged teenagers um, who use the most products daily should really be using the safest products. So that is a demographic I am working very hard to get um, this curricula into, uh, into schools and high schools. Um, but yeah, once you know what's in the products or what the alternatives are, and there are many, it's really empowering and very, very um, exciting for people to be conscious of what they um, control over their bodies. 